Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us again. I'm Pastor Steve Green. This is Brad and Word of Faith Church. My wife Penny and I pastor here today is Sunday, January 7th. We're talking about sowing to the spirit. Uh, the title of our message today is Sowing to the Spirit, Learning How to Swim. We're going to use swimming as an illustration of what it means to sow to the spirit, what it means to walk in the spirit. I believe that, that there is a lack of clarity, I think, many times in the lives of Christians, what it exactly means to walk in the spirit, or what it, what it looks like, how to do it, why it's necessary. What we want to emphasize is the necessity of walking in the spirit and the benefits that come from doing it. So we're going to use as, uh, as a starting point uh, an article written by a lady named Melon Dash. I know nothing about her other than the fact that I've read the article. In addition to the article, she has also um, <clears throat> written a book. And the name of the book is Conquer Your Fear of Water, A Revolutionary Way to Learn to Swim Without Ever Feeling Afraid. <laughs> I'm a little unsure of that. Uh, I'm not quite uh, convinced that you can, um, people can so manage their feelings as to be completely unafraid of the water uh, before they even get in, but that's what she's advertising. Uh, we are going to read her article, um, and uh, without debating exactly how true it all it is, we're, we're going to use a, it, use it as an illustration of walking in the Spirit. We read in Galatians 6 and verse 8, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So we see here that there's such a thing called sowing to the Spirit. So uh, <clears throat> this book, this lady, Mel and Dash, she's a swimmer and a swimming instructor. Maybe Dash is a good name for if you're a competitive swimmer. She used to be a competitive swimmer. Uh, she runs a swim academy in Sarasota, Florida, strictly for adults with fear in water. So to attend this academy, you have to be an adult and you have to be afraid. <laughs> and the views here are the views expressed here are her own. Uh, so, <clears throat> again, we, uh, I think she, there's a lot of what she says that's going to be helpful as by way of uh, analogy or uh, illustration. Some of it I'm not sure that, you know, what to think about it. In any case, here are some excerpts from the article. She says, I noticed, however, that half of my students couldn't follow my instructions. They were afraid. My students needed a class before beginning swimming. So she's describing that they couldn't hear her, couldn't understand, couldn't, couldn't follow, couldn't do what she's saying because they're too afraid they can't hear what she's saying. She has to find a way to help them get past their fear before she can teach them how to swim. That's the case that she's making. Uh, she continues, a Gallup survey published two years ago found that across the globe half of adults are afraid in water over their heads. And that's just in pools. A third of American adults are afraid to even put their heads underwater. So she's continuing to make a case here that this is a big deal. There's a lot of adults that can't swim, a lot of adults that are afraid of the water, afraid to put even their head under the water. When you hear about lessons, she continues, and I'm just reading excerpts, not the whole article. When you hear about lessons and drowning prevention efforts, they are almost always aimed at keeping children safe. But adults account for three out of four drowning deaths. And so uh, there again, she's uh, citing statistics, building a case. She says, and for non-swimmers of any age, uh, finding yourself in water over your head can be fatal. Uh, she says later, comfort in deep water is essential and life-saving. So this is her main point again, is wanting um, even more important than learning strokes, it's learning to be comfortable in the water. That's the case that she's making. When afraid adults register for swimming lessons, they presume that at long last, they will be able to feel at ease in deep water. And she goes on to describe how sometimes um, that isn't true. The instructor's trying to teach strokes and they're trying to get to where they're not afraid and they're, that there's a disconnect happening there. Uh, she says, how does one address people's fear in the water? Give them an environment where it's okay to be afraid. So I, I get the impression from the article that she is 
proposing a, um, some lessons that are not in the water, that are really not swimming at all, but rather talking about swimming, talking about water, talking about fears. Um, give them an environment where it's okay to be afraid, where they hear that others' fears are the same as their own, where they are warm, not cold, where there is no pressure to perform, and where they have time to slow down and feel what they feel. So, uh, as we've stated, we're going to compare what she's saying here with what it is to walk in the Spirit. And, and here we'll make a connection with the spiritual side of things. There's a word used in Hebrews 7.22, we'll read that in a minute, but we'll define it first. In the Oxford Dictionary, uh, the definition of surety, S-U-R-E-T-Y, the definition is a person who takes responsibility for another's performance of an undertaking. So we just read where she says um, people need to be free from the pressure to perform, free from pressure to perform. And here we're reading that Jesus is the one who takes responsibility for our performance, and in particular, our performance of righteousness. So this, so this would then be, if, if this is true, if this um, is something we can get a handle on, this is gonna make a big difference. Then if we realize that uh, when it comes to you and I performing righteousness, which is going to be the basis of walking in the spirit, then, um, uh, uh, and if there's a fear factor involved, then understanding that Jesus is there to take responsibility for my performance of righteousness, he is going to guarantee, he's going to ensure that this is going to work, um, then that's going to be a huge advantage. We read in Hebrews 7, 22, and then we'll read verses 25 and 26. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. So Jesus is the surety, and we, we need to know how this works. In fact, what we're going to find is, and I think this is um, perhaps obvious to us, is that it works by faith. In other words, if you and I sit back and do nothing about it, then the guarantee falls flat. Jesus can't make us righteous if we're simply doing nothing. There has to be something on our part, a step of faith that he can join with the step of faith, and there the guarantee takes effect. There he becomes a surety. Um, so what is assumed in this statement where it says Jesus is the surety of a better covenant is that we are going to engage in this on the level that we need to do that. He continues in verse 25, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And so the word intercede means to intervene. And so again, this relates well to the swimming instruction. This uh, relates well to the performance issue. He, um, he is guaranteeing that uh, he will take responsibility for our performance. He always lives to intervene. So if we're in the water, if we're uh, comparing uh, walking in the Spirit to physically being in water, then Jesus is saying he is there all the time to intervene. Uh, maybe a good illustration might be Peter walking on the water. We're talking about swimming in that story. He's walking on the water, but the fact is, is when he began to sink, when he became afraid, there's that issue of fear again, when he became afraid of the water and the waves and the wind, and he started to fall, then Jesus was immediately there to take his hand and ensure that he was safe. And so I think we're getting a mental picture of what this looks like. Jesus is saying that if we will take the steps to do righteousness, even though righteousness may seem foreign to us, it might seem perilous, it might seem intimidating, it might seem that it's unreasonable, that it's too hard, we can't do it, however it might seem to us, Jesus is promising he will be there, he will guarantee our performance, he will intervene um, as necessary. Uh, and then it says in verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, and we're focusing on that word harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. So the three things in these three verses that we've read about Jesus is that he will guarantee our performance, he will intervene on our behalf, and he is harmless. And so all of these things would be, I think clearly, um, uh, things that if we believe these things, they are going to alleviate our tendency to be afraid. Uh, and that is, you know, uh, 
what the lady who's writing the article is getting at about uh, swimming. Now, I'm not entirely sure that uh, in her example of swimming that she can do what she claims to do, but perhaps she can. I, I don't know. Uh, one more excerpt from her article. A student cannot be afraid for their life and also be expected to learn. Uh, it's important to acknowledge that emotional and psychological barriers prevent non-swimmers from becoming swimmers. And that, and that may be true in our case too. It may be that emotional, in fact, the reason I'm using the illustration is because I think it is true that emotional and psychological barriers prevent Christians from learning to walk in the Spirit. Uh, that would be why we're using this analogy. Now, one thing where I do, f where, where the analogy doesn't work, or the illustration doesn't work, is her point is, is that she thinks she can get people to be completely unafraid of water before they ever get in the water. Um, in other words, you remove the fear completely, and then they can learn how to swim. That's what she's advocating. Uh, on the spiritual side, uh, walking in the Spirit, which is going to be, to be clear, what is walking in the Spirit? It's walking um, in obedience to the things that Jesus taught us. It's going to be walking in love would be another way to put it, because everything Jesus said was talking about walking in love. It's going to be um, uh, walking in righteousness, the functional righteousness, not righteousness of law. A lot of times, in, even in the Christian world, when we think of righteousness, we think of righteousness uh, that's legal in nature, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about righteousness that is based upon faith in God. So they're black and white, two different things entirely. Uh, and so we read in 1 John 4.18, uh, John says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And so he's saying that as we perfect love, which is the activity, then, then fear is going to be uh, eliminated from our heart, uh, which is opposite to what this lady is saying about swimming. She wants to eliminate fear so people can swim. God is saying, I want you to start swimming and it will eliminate the fear. <laughs> Uh, it's probably uh, a circular thing where, where at some point, uh, whatever comes first, I don't know, um, but there needs to be some faith. There needs to be some faith that this is the right thing to do. So we, we step out in faith. We do what we're being asked to do. And then, um, and it might just be a tiny step. Um, but associated with that, there will be uh, a certain amount of fear that then leaves. And because we're less afraid, then we're more willing to take the next step. And the more, and after we take that step, then and it's um, driving fear out. Then then we're less afraid, of course. And then we are willing to take more steps. And so it's going to be a, a circular or cyclical type of thing. Um, we're talking about in the spirit now. We're talking about walking in the spirit. So continuing our illustration then, imagine that we have a bay of water. Um, I'm not sure how big it is. It could be big or it could be little, but we have a coastline and it's a curving coastline. And so it forms, um, the water forms a, a bay and there is a location on one side of the bay that we're calling A and a location on the other side of the bay that we're calling B. So a very simple mental picture, a coastline, water, land, A and B. And so the idea is, is that we live in A, and this is still an illustration, um, <clears throat> we're not talking about our real lives yet, this is, this is an illustrative picture. Um, we live at A, but we regularly go to B. So uh, B could be a lot of things. Um, it, it could be, if we don't have modern plumbing, B could be our outhouse. <laughs> so we're going from A to B pretty regularly. Or, uh, uh, and, and so imagine this, okay, we gotta go from A to B, but there's water there. We could go across the water, which would mean swimming, or we could go on land, which would mean walking. So that's the picture, but, but uh, A might be the community we live in and B might be a different community. That might be the case. And B happens to be where we go to school or go to work or where we buy groceries. So uh, it, these different scenarios all fit, but the, but the thing is, is that we live at A and we need to go to B. We need to get to B somehow. So there's no automobiles, no horses, no roads. Uh, we can't fly. So there's only two options, uh, and that being to either to walk or to swim. So uh, for the sake of our illustration, let's assume that we are able-bodied, so we're well capable of walking, and um, we don't know how to swim. 
And so that's the picture. So the question then is, how are you going to get from A to B? So now uh, swinging around and bringing this to bear upon our personal lives, um, <clears throat> in our life now, and now this is talking really about you and I. It's talking about our life. It's not talking physically about going from A to B, like they're two different locations, but, but I'll describe what we mean. In our lives, uh, we are always going from A to B in one way or another. For example, even just um, on any given day, we get up in the morning and in that day there's things we want to do, things we could do, should do, uh, are going to do, are going to try to do, and so throughout that day we're going to be going from A to B or endeavoring to go to A and B, go from A to B. This is what we intend to hope to should be wanting to accomplish in the course of that day so if if that's what we're talking about then we're going from A to B but uh, A and B could represent different things it could represent uh, B could represent becoming a journeyman carpenter for example so in order to get from A which is where you're not one to get there you would have to go you'd have to be an apprentice and you'd have to put in the hours and you'd have to write the tests and maybe do the schooling that would be everything involved with going from A to B. Um, <clears throat> A to B could, rep B could represent um, A is you're presently living in a home, you're renting, but you would like to get to where you own. Um, so A would be where you live, renting, B would be owning a home. Um, B um, might be uh, not just owning a home, but uh, owning a home mortgage-free. So you're trying to get from A to B, you're trying to get your mortgage paid off. Uh, it could be getting married. So then A would be single, B would be married. <laughs> and a person is trying to find their way uh, from A to B. So it's going to, A to B is going to represent a lot of different things. It could be dozens of different things. It, it's important things, things of any value in our life, be they small things or be they big things, be they short-term goals or perhaps very long-term goals. Um, we can get past some of these things and um, you know, just practical day-to-day -day things like paying our mortgage um, into maybe more of um, a spiritual thing or more of a, 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 a relational thing. For example, we might want to form deep and rewarding relationships um, and those don't come overnight. So that would clearly be going from A to B. Uh, we might be wanting to get to know God. And so again, that also isn't going to happen overnight. So that would be a uh, long-term goal, hopefully with uh, short-term results and benefits, but nevertheless a long-term goal. So in, in any case, all of these things represent our desire to go from A to B. So uh, uh, it's what we're doing every day. And so the question then becomes, um, how do we best go about doing that? So we have two roots now, uh, according to our diagram, which um, in, in church I have a whiteboard drawn, but here at YouTube we're, we're using our imagination. Uh, we have the overland route, which represents doing it naturally. It's living naturally, using all of our natural strengths and abilities, um, our determination, our, our, our aptitudes, anything that you and I might have naturally, bringing those things to bear upon whatever the situation. It's, it involves good intention. Um, it's not spiritual. We're not talking spiritual, but nevertheless, many times people are not spiritual, but, but they have good intentions. They're meaning well. They're trying hard. They have many different issues in their life where they're going from A to B and they want to do a good job of it. They're following the natural principles of life. And so the key word here is going to be the word first. Uh, the overland route represents when we depend first upon our natural abilities. That's our, our first, our primary um, method of uh, getting from A to B is depending upon whatever intelligence, discipline, you know what I'm talking about, whatever it is that we have that can help us succeed, that is what we're going to use. So um, clearly then, uh, just as it was in the illustration, uh, the overland route is going to be the obvious choice, uh, especially seeing as we can't swim. I mean, <laughs> what other choice do we have? We're gonna, we're gonna wanna walk. Uh, it's what everyone does, but now we're back to the, the um, the more practical application to our real lives, the, the using our natural abilities, it's what everyone does, it's what we know how to do, and there's going to be a very significant comfort level to it. However, 
uh, for all of the many reasons why that is the way we would want to do it, there is an issue, and it's a big one. It's a huge issue, and there's a curse on it. And we're going to look at scripture that indicates that. Uh, and so the curse, if we take the overland route, it means we're going to suffer the effects of a curse. Um, it seems obvious that it's the best route, but again, this is huge. There's going to be... Um, life-threatening issues along the way. And when I say life, that could mean literally dying, or it could just mean things affecting the quality of our life. The curse is going to affect our family. Uh, it's going to affect our relationships. It's going to affect our mental health, our physical health. It's going to affect finances. The curse is random. It, it isn't proportional. It's not the bad people get more of a curse and, <laughs> and the more good people get less of a curse. It's just random. It's arbitrary. Um, not all of the not all of the characteristics of the curse fall on every person, but but one person will experience some of this, another person will experience some of that. But the fact is, is none of it is good. So that is the problem with the overland route. Now the water route uh, represents uh, living spiritually, living by faith. It represents following spiritual principles of life instead of following natural principles. It means. And here would be the key thing again. It means depending first upon the ability of the Spirit. Um, and, and so the natural route, the overland route, is depending first upon our natural abilities. And the water route depends upon the ability, our dependence upon the ability of the Spirit of God working in and through us, which is going to be a foreign concept. It's going to be unfamiliar. It's like learning how to swim, but not knowing how. Um, there's going to be some deep water here. We don't want to get hurt. We don't want to drown. We don't want to choose a foolish way of trying to live, a way that um, either is never going to work or it would work, except we won't work it right. Um, there's going to be some way that I'm going to die <laughs> as I'm, or get badly hurt uh, as I go about this. So, so this would be what we're talking about, is this is why we're comparing walking in the Spirit with swimming. Some of the same issues that the lady in the article describes uh, about swimming are going to apply with what the Bible is teaching us about walking in the Spirit. Um, that walking in the Spirit would be, and, and, and this is so, so, so helpful to, to see this next thought and, and to, to get it because um, many, many Christians might agree, yes, walk in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. But even though we agree that walking in the Spirit is the right thing to do, those who sow to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Those who sow to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap life and life everlasting. Clearly, sowing to the Spirit or walking in the Spirit is going to be the, the right thing to do. And yet we could still have quite a few different opinions about what that is. <laughs> And what it looks like, and uh, and we'll be addressing uh, these exact questions in the time to come. Um, maybe a little bit today, but also in the weeks to come. But so, walking in the spirit, the key feature of it, by far the key feature, the first and most important feature of walking in the spirit is going to be walking by faith. It's going to mean walking according to righteousness, the kind of faith that obeys, the kind of faith that loves other people, the kind of faith that performs righteousness. And again, we don't want people to be afraid of this, and very we easily could be, because as we see the characteristics of righteousness, we're going to see that, that righteousness is not our natural habitat. In the same way that water physically is not our natural habitat, land is, uh, we're going to see that uh, walking in the Spirit, walking by faith, walking in righteousness, righteousness is, is clearly not our natural habitat. It's going to involve doing things that human beings uh, don't do or seldom do or perhaps never do. It's going to be a strange way of doing it. In the very same way, if you're going to get groceries, swimming across the bay to, to get groceries would seem a very strange way of, of, of trying to come home with some groceries. Um, but this is what we read. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and those two are not two different, two entirely separate things. The kingdom of God and and His righteousness um, sync together. Uh, they're part of the same picture. Uh, seek first uh, His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
And so, so what the scripture is telling us to do, what Jesus is telling us to do, is to make righteousness our first priority. It is, it is where we place most of our emphasis. It is the one thing above any other thing that is going to guarantee our success. Going by way of the water means going by way of the blessing. It's the way of blessing. It's the way of life. Uh, it is a way that is free from the curse. So right away there, if one way is going to be cursed, one way from A to B is going to be cursed, and another way is going to be blessed, then, then our perspective ought to be shifting now. Instead of the overland route being the obvious route to take, more and more, the more clearly we see this, the more it will appear to us that going by water, as odd as it may seem, as challenging as it may be, it's going to increasingly appear to be the only intelligent way to go and that and that's a good thing the more we see that uh, the better it is the water is not our natural habitat but it is God's natural habitat it, it is the realm of the spirit it is living in the spirit it is walking in the spirit it is doing things in a spiritual way God is in the water and he is saying come on in the water is fine uh, how many times maybe you've heard somebody say that if you've spent any time around water where people are swimming then then and probably you've heard it maybe many times. Somebody's in the water, somebody is outside the water, they might be a little reluctant, they might be sticking their toe in, it might seem a little cold at first, and, but somebody in the water is saying, come on in. <laughs> It's, it's good. It's refreshing. You're going you're gonna to warm up. You're going to like it. This is fine. Uh, and that's what God is saying to us. He's inviting us into the water. More than that, really, to, to tell the truth, he's commanding us to come into the water. That is the way. This is, this is the only way that works. And so if we were to compare this now to uh, an illustration, part of the illustration we gave before, which is say a person wants to become uh, a journeyman carpenter. Well, um, if a person takes the overland route, which would be depending upon natural ability, then they would need to, of course, go through the process of being an apprentice carpenter first um, in order to become a journeyman carpenter. Uh, now, if a person chooses to take the what we're describing as the water route or the spirit route, then, in fact, the same is going to be true. In order to become a journeyman carpenter, if this is what we mean by going from A to B, this is an important life choice. It's a person choosing their vocation, what they might do for decades of their life, how they earn money, how they raise a family, how they give to God. Um, if a person wants to do this in a spiritual way, they are also going to need to uh, be an apprentice carpenter first. So. Uh, in this sense, or to this extent, walking by natural ability and walking by uh, spiritual ability, are go it's going to appear the same both ways. However, the distinction is going to be the first priority in a person's heart and mind. If the first, if I'm the person we're speaking about, and if my first priority is living righteously, and and second to that uh, is going through all the necessary steps of apprenticeship and whatever is necessary to become a journeyman carpenter, then I will in fact be going from A to B in a spiritual way. Even though in some ways it looks like the overland route, I am in fact taking the water route. I'm learning to swim. I'm doing it a spiritual way. All right, so this is how Paul explained it to the Galatians. <clears throat> and there's probably a lot of, um, there's just a number, a few verses here, a half a dozen verses or, or short passages, uh, that the content um, in these verses we could probably talk about for hours, but I'm going to quickly skim over it. So we start in Galatians 2 and verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Uh, and the life which I now live in the flesh. So if Paul, if Paul was going to be a journeyman carpenter, then he wasn't. He, he was a tradesperson, though. He was a tent maker. But if he was going to be a journeyman carpenter, he, his life he's living is in the flesh. He's going to have to do natural things. He is going to have to go through the apprenticeship. But he says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So that's, that's a key characteristic of being spiritual, is living by faith. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself 
for me. Um, and so that word, that word gave is paradidomai, uh, which means to yield or to surrender. So what Paul is saying is that Jesus, when he died on the cross for Paul, is that Jesus surrendered himself. He gave himself entirely to the cause that God had for him, and it included going to the cross. Uh, it included dying and even the death of the cross, as we read in Philippians. So, so Jesus gave himself for him. And now Paul is saying that he has faith in Jesus. So what this means, especially as we study this and look at it line upon line, is that what Paul is saying is the life of faith means he's going to be walking out after the same pattern that Jesus did. So just as Jesus loved and gave, now Paul is going to be learning to love and give himself as well. Jesus loved Paul and gave himself for him, and now in relationship, Paul is going to be um, loving Jesus back and likewise giving himself for him. Not, not in the sense of dying on a cross exactly, but in the sense of yielding himself to Jesus for the cause, for the purpose of righteousness. So this is how Paul can say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The only way that he can say that is if he is yielding, he's giving himself, he's paradidomizing himself, he's yielding, he's surrendering himself to where um, Jesus is directing him into righteousness. And it is Jesus who is um, leading the way in Paul's life, and it's no longer Paul. Now, I think an important thing we can observe here is that... Um, the issue is righteousness. And, and so if we apply this to ourselves, if you like, um, uh, if you want to be this person, this spiritual person, this person walking in the spirit, um, then there's going to be many things in your life that won't change. Probably not at all. Um, if you like wearing, I like wearing hoodies and, and I can wear hoodies if I'm walking in the spirit. It's okay. I don't have to wear something different. If you like a certain type of food to eat, very likely, unless it's very, very, very bad for you. You know, if you liked it before you're walking in the spirit, you can continue to eat the same food after you're walking in the spirit. So there's going to be many things in our life that aren't going to change at all. Uh, when we talk about surrendering, uh, we talk about yield. It is particularly um, focused on the issue of righteousness, things that Jesus said that, that are necessary for living righteously. That is where the focus is. Um, and so uh, Paul continues in Galatians 2, he says in verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So he's saying this is how righteousness comes. Uh, the only way that you and I can truly be righteous, it's a supernatural thing. Again, it's not our natural habitat. It's not the natural way of living. It is a foreign way of living. It is like swimming compared to walking. Um, the only way that you and I can live righteously is by hearing what Jesus has to say, having faith in him, trusting, yielding, surrendering, stepping out, beginning to do the things that he says, which means, figuratively speaking, we're going to have to get down into the water. We're going to have to get down there, get knee deep, thigh deep. We're going to have to splash around a little bit. And, and then Jesus is going to come alongside of us and he is personally going to guarantee our success. He is going to intervene. He is going to hold us up. He's going to make sure we're not swallowing water. He's going to, he's going to guarantee. He's going to guarantee this is a harmless, as, as as frightening as it might be to some to begin with. He's going to guarantee that you cannot be harmed in doing this. He will personally. He is a harmless high priest. He will ensure your success in this. But it's going to take faith for you and I to get in the water. We're going to have to start to do it. We're going to have to commit to it. Uh, and that's another way the word paradidomai is translated to surrender surrender to it's it's translated here to give Paul, God loved him Jesus loved him gave him gave himself for him uh, he yielded surrendered committing committing uh, and so uh, that's how this word is also translated in the New Testament uh, so so we're going to need to commit to the water but we're but we're guaranteed that it's going to work and it's going to work well in fact it's going to work much better than the overland route um, this is how righteousness comes we read in chapter 3 of Galatians in verse 1. 
um, which is the next verse. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. The significance of that is um, the, the Galatians have chosen a way of living. They're truly born again, truly saved, truly children of God. Um, their sins have been forgiven. They are in the family, in the kingdom. Uh, they're new creatures in Christ, and yet they are choosing a natural way of living uh, as opposed to a spiritual way. That's why he says, O foolish Galatians. And then he says, Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. So the point of that is that Paul is saying that, that you have a very clear, clear picture of Jesus dying on the cross, and that picture of how Jesus died is a picture of how we live. In other words, you're going to need, just like Jesus, when he was crucified, he gave himself, paradidomide himself. We ourselves are going to need to paradidomide ourselves. In other words, we're going to need to commit to him. We're going to need to get in the water. We're going to need to hear what Jesus said. We're going to need to take steps. We're going to need to commit to living righteously. And he, again, will guarantee our success success in it. Um, and we will successfully, uh, and perhaps against our initial expectations, we will do a far, far better job of getting from A to B than we were, would have been able to do had we done it in our natural ability. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Praise the Lord. And so Paul continues in Galatians 3 and verse 2. He says, the only thing I want to learn from you is did you receive the Spirit? He's talking about when they were first saved. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Clearly, it was by faith. They didn't work their way into it. They received the, the benefit of Jesus by faith. He says in verse um, 3, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh, by, by approaching life in a natural way? Um, and clearly the answer to that is no. The way to, to perfection, and perfection is a condition of heart, as we've discussed in different weeks, the, the, the way to having our heart cleansed and becoming uh, pure in heart, and therefore uh, it becomes much, much easier as we go, as our heart becomes progressively cleansed to live righteously. It becomes our nature to do so. Um, that is the, it is by that cleansing of our heart that our heart is made perfect. And he's saying, you know, if you, if you, if you, if the only way you could get saved in the first place was by the Spirit, it's also going to be true. The only way you can be perfected is also by the Spirit or also by faith. You're going to have to need to trust in Jesus. We read in chapter 3 and verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Free. And so there's a curse. We can read about it. It's in, it's in, in uh, Deuteronomy 28 verses 15 to maybe 68 or somewhere around there. It's a long passage of scripture, many different curses on it. We have been redeemed from that curse. And the way that we experience our redemption from the curse is by faith. And the kind of faith that Paul is talking about in the book of Galatians is the kind of faith that obeys, the kind of faith that is righteous. So simply by by learning righteousness and trusting Jesus to help us to be righteous people, in the process of perfecting righteousness, we are being um, progressively um, uh, saved from the curse of the law. And, and there it is. Uh, we read in Galatians 3 and verse 21, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, so we're talking about life and death, blessing and cursing, the, the life of God being the blessed life. Um, if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law, talking of the law of Moses. So what, again, rephrasing what Paul is saying is if there was a law that could have made us righteous, then that same law would give us, would give us life. If there was a natural way if there was any kind of natural way of living that could possibly make us righteous, then we could experience life. We could experience success in getting from A to B in every different way and dimension of it. Um, if there was a natural way of living which could do that, well then good. But he's saying that there is no natural way uh, to righteousness and therefore there is no natural way to, to life. Life comes from righteous living. The life of God comes from righteous living. Well, um, there we go. As always, I was thinking of getting a little bit further 
<laughs> in our, but um, I think I think we've um, where there's a certain time frame we'd like to operate in, and and so we'll um, leave it for there for now. So we're talking about learning how to swim, but we're learning to, we're, we're learning how to swim spiritually, uh, and and so that's going to take courage on our part. We're going to need to get in the water. We're going to have to believe that Jesus is everything He says He is. That it's guaranteed to succeed. We're not going to get hurt, and that we therefore have courage. We have some boldness. We have faith to proceed ahead and to learn righteousness, which Jesus is going to teach us how to do. In fact, He's going to ensure our success in righteous living. Thanks for joining us today.